I've been a student my entire life. When I was a kid, I loved building things with Legos. My friends and I, we would create these intricate adventures and castles. We would, we would build ships and houses. And we were doing a lot more than just tinkering with toys. We were playing. Play is a child's first exposure to real world problem solving. Through play, children must use all of the different tools at their disposal to solve a given problem and achieve a given goal. For us, that goal was building a castle when we, have, when we had Legos. For my sister, it was creating a story and she had a dollhouse and her Polly Pocket dolls. For another child, it might be creating a sand castle out of sand, a bucket, and a shovel. John Holt, an American author and pioneer in youth rights theory, wrote his book, How Children Learn. The child is curious. He, wa he wants to make sense of the things around him. Find out how things work. He wants to discover um, a sense of certainty in himself. And um, he doesn't merely observe the world around him. He touches it, tastes it, hefts it, bends it, and breaks it. He is bold. He is not afraid to make mistakes. And he is patient. He can tolerate an extraordinary amount of uncertainty, of surprise, of um, uncertainty, surprise, and um, yeah, certainty and surprise. <laughs> um, the children are natural learners. Children have intrinsic curiosity and intrinsic, curio and intrinsic curiosity and intrinsic creativity that must be nurtured. But unfortunately, our public school systems do nearly the opposite. Instead of nurturing their, instead of nurturing their curiosity and fostering their creativity, we hammer them with test after test. Um, we create a ruthless cycle of test followed by memorization, followed by test followed by memorization. Um, and it's really quite interesting. So we introduced grades and standardized testing around the third grade, and right around that same time is when students say they, students start saying they dislike school, they dislike the very concept of learning. And as, men, as you saw in Dr. Woodworth's presentation, school is boring. Why, why should school be boring? Um, like, what happens here? What goes wrong? What do we do to make students dislike learning? And I believe that we change the motive. When learning used to be about fun, discovering things, it, when it used to be fun and, uh, about discovering things, now it's about getting a number that may not, getting a number of grade that may not even matter 10 years from now. Um, so how do we fix this? How do we get students to enjoy learning again? How do we reignite that curiosity and creativity? And unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. There's no easy solution to this. However, there is an educational philosophy called constructivism. And constructivism focuses on exposing the natural learner in students. Um, the instructor in a constructivist classroom doesn't teach, they guide. They facilitate the natural learning process. Um, so let's take a look at an example of this. Um, I'm going to show you a computer science concept called the for loop, using the traditional method of teaching. And, the, and then using a constructivist approach. So before we get into the for loop, we must know two things about computer science. Um, this line of code, uh, system.out.println, that just prints something out of your program into the command line. So in this case, we're printing hello world. And if we run it, we'll see that it prints out hello world. Um, and then moving on, we also have things called variables. And variables are just like variables in your math classroom. They're just names that represent values. So here we're creating a new variable called i. It's an integer, so it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and so on. It just can't have decimal places. So we're creating a new variable called i, and we're setting it to 0. And then we print out the value of i. And then we set i to 1, and we print out the value of i. And then we set i to 5, and we print out the value of i. So let's run this and see what happens. Notice how um, what we printed reflects um, at the value of i as we changed it over time. So let's take a look at the for loop. Um, the for loop has, this is a traditional approach. The for loop has three parts. First, we're creating a new variable called i and we're setting it to one. The second part is a conditional. We're saying, okay, so while the value of i is less than or equal to three, run the code between the two curly braces. In this case, system.out.println hello world. And then a after each time we um, run that code, we add one to i. That's what i++ does. So what's going to happen here is we're, gonna, we're creating a new variable, i set to 1. Is 1 less than or equal to 3? Yes, 
Run the code, print out hello world. Add one to i, i is now two. Is two less than or equal to three? Yes, two, two is less than or equal to three. Print out hello world. Um, and then add one to i. Is three less than or equal to three? Yes, print out hello world. Add one to i. Is four less than or equal to three? No, it's not, we're done. So let's run it and see what happens. Notice how I printed out hello world three times because we, we iterated three times. So this is, a, this is the traditional approach. Notice how we told you how the for loop works. Let's take a look at a much more constructivist approach of doing this. So I can print out hello world to the console using this line, right? So what is the easiest way to print out hello world five times? And we'll ask the students this, and the students may suggest, well, we could type it out or we could copy and paste it. So let's try that. Oh, got it. Okay, yeah, so we can just copy and paste Hello World out to the console five times, and let's run this to see what happens. And we'll notice that it printed out Hello World five times, but what if we want to do this ten times? What if we want to do this a hundred times? Programmers are some of the laziest creatures on the planet. We don't, we don't like repeating ourselves. This is far too much work, far too much things to type out. Um, so since we're lazy, we create a thing called the for loop. It's just a way of repeating code. So we have this, it prints out Hello World five times. Let's rewrite this using the for loop. Take a look at that. How could we, how could, uh, let's run it. And we'll notice that it prints out Hello World five times. How could we print out Hello World three times instead of five times? And we'll let the student experiment. And they may say, okay, well we could change five to three. And we'll try that and we'll notice that it only prints out Hello World three times, or what if we wanted to do it four times? The slide's kind of messed up, but um, we can change it to four and see it prints out four times. Notice how I didn't tell you what's happening in the for loop. Notice how the student had to discover what's actually happening. I just gave enough information to, to start the discovery process. A for loop repeats code, that's it. And then the student experimented to actually figure out how, do, how can I apply this. Um, and what, what we just did was we just created a much deeper connection to the concept. The student will remember this. It's because we're not just telling them this. And I've, I've seen a lot of teachers um, throughout my schooling. And I've noticed three big things that the best teachers I have, I've had do. Um, they let the student figure things out. Don't just tell them information. Don't just tell your students information. Have them come to you. Help guide uh, um, and the next, which leads to the first one. There we go. Yeah, we want to make the student ask questions. Not always necessarily to the instructor, but also to themselves. What does happen when I change five to three? What happens if I, what would happen if I, instead of saying less than or equal to three, I did greater than or equal to three? What happens if I didn't start with I equal to one? What if I named I something else completely? This experimentation drives a process of discovery, which creates these very deep connections with the concepts you're learning. And then finally, well, you can't see it, but um, teachers are there to guide, the best teachers i found guide the learning process. They're a guide, they're not a teacher. They don't tell information, they help the student figure it out. Thank you.